speed bunny boat like a bird on the wing onward the sailors cry carry the lad that is born to be king over the sea to sky tonight on first look we're setting sail for the scottish isles Scotland. The name alone reverberates the strong sentiments of a proud nation. In Edinburgh, the new parts of the city date back to the 1700s, and the stunning countryside grounds sheer fantasy in reality. It's the kind of place that seems instantly familiar, even if foreign. It's the kind of place that envelops you with its warmth, with its culture, and its charm. And that's just the mainland. The seaport town of Oban is the gateway to the Scottish Isles. So before you set sail, you need to pass through. And you absolutely need to sample the local catch at the Oban Seafood Hut. Literally the food comes right out of the water and you get first pick. I mean, you're right here. Famous prawn sandwich, the local crab sandwich, squid, mussels, sweet herring. Can I help you? Pretty much a little bit of everything, yeah. Could I get the seafood platter, please? Thank you. When they say a platter, they give you the whole platter. Nothing not to be excited about here. Where are you guys from? China. China? You come here just, just for the seafood? Yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. All right, guys. Nice chatting with you. Okay. But I got a ship to catch. I've come to Scotland a number of times, but I've never gone to the islands. This is a whole new exploration for me. This is, this is, this is, uncharted territory, but it's totally in my wheelhouse. This is the kind of stuff that I live for. Let the adventure begin. Divided into four clusters, the Northern Isles of Orkney and Shetland, and the Inner and Outer Hebrides, which are also known as the Western Isles. There are collectively nearly 800 individual offshore islands that make up the Scottish Isles. It's really just so beautiful and calm. I just want to explore. The Isle of Barra boasts stunning island beauty. Wind-kissed rocky terrain to the west. To the east, rolling hills, white sand beaches, turquoise waters, and complete serenity. It's maybe one of the most peaceful places I've ever been in my entire life. As if I am a gazillion miles away, there's no traffic, there's no horns, there's no city hustle and bustle. You're just out here. You hear the lapping of the waves. You hear the wind rustling. It's so beautiful. I just want to, I want to do more. Woo! That's what it's all about. With regular flights to Barra from Glasgow landing right on the beach, Island Adventure is just an hour away. And as amazing as the islands can be to explore solo, what's a Scottish adventure without a Scottish traveling companion? And I know just the Scott to tour me around. Mr. Alan Cumming. Hello, George. Meet again. How are you? You got a plane? Didn't you come by plane? No, I, I took the ferry. Oh. Yeah. I see that I love the ferry. It's sort of decompressed on the way. 100%. I walked on this island totally zen. Yeah. So what, what do we do here in, in Barra? Um, you chill out. That's what I love about it. I'm all right with that. Especially if I have you and... Lala, this is her second visit. Hello there, Lala. Yeah, she's been to Barra twice in the last month. <laughs> Lucky dog. She's an island dog. So we've seen the airport. Where do we go from here? The Gallic word for island is Kismal. And the aptly named and impenetrable fortress known as Kismal Castle dates back to as early as the 11th century. What gets me is how complicated it would be to lug all the stones to build this. And it's just incredible. These people in, in these islands are... So hardy and tough. Resilient, yeah. Constructed by the McNeil clan to fortify Barra and its seaways, while housing the clan chief and his galley sailors, Kismal is as captivating as it is timeless. Just so unbelievable that this was built with stone and, yeah. and seashells and lime. And it's still standing. It's miraculous. Shall we go back to the mainland and have whiskey? To the pub? Aye. <laughs> a 
If you're throwing back a pint, sipping a dram, or both here in Barra, then you're drinking at the Castle Bay Hotel Bar to the sounds of the Battersea Boys. They're legends, Le Barra legends. You know you're at the right place if they're playing at the bar. I think people think, oh, the bar's where you go to escape. Well, here, it's the bar's where you go to, 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 to gather. Commune, commune. Yeah. yeah. I think Scotland in general, people come together to drink and to talk. And also, especially in a, you know, a remote area like this, when people are actually living far away from each other, the bar is where you come together and just have company. There's music, kids come in. It's a very familial experience and really important in the way that you exist. It is very inviting and it feels like it's like one of the hubs of the community. Absolutely. And as night falls on the aisles and music and goodwill fill the air, we're reminded that the journey has only just begun. I'll drink to that. First Look is brought to you in part by Visit Scotland. Start planning your vacation at visitscotland.com 2017. The beauty of the Scottish Isles, aside from the fact that every direction you look there's something magnificent to see, is that regular ferry service between the islands makes hopping from one to another as easy as one, two, three. Oh, isn't that lovely? It smells like the shore. Oh, I love that smell. So where are we headed? Eriskay. Eriskay? Did I say that right? Yeah, Eriskay. Eriskay. It's a beautiful island, and I suppose it's most famous for a thing that happened that became known as Whiskey Galore. Ooh, what's the Whiskey Galore? So in 1941, this ship sailing from Liverpool called the SS Politician ran aground, and it was carrying 28,000 cases of whiskey. The local fishermen went on board the ship dressed up in the women's clothes so that the oil of the boats and everything wouldn't mark on their clothes so they wouldn't be known. Well thought out. Oh, well, you yeah. know, when whiskey's concerned. So they kind of pilfered the whole thing and then the, the tax man came because it was all duty-free whiskey and they did the most ingenious methods of hiding it all around the village. Wow, that's a, that's a crazy story. It really captures the sort of spirit of, of these islands. Chances are good that I'll find some whiskey on Eriskay. Oh yeah, and maybe even a bottle of whiskey from that very boat. Beyond a captivating history, Eriskay boasts an even prouder fishing tradition, which may not entice everyone like my vegan friend Alan. But should you desire to try your luck out on the open sea, you could do no better than with Captain David Steele and his brother Paul of USC Tours. And we're off. Ah, uh, searching for the big one. How many generations has your family been up here? Well, my father and my grandfather, both sides fished at sea, and uncles on both sides. If it's in your blood, then it's hard to get away from. It's just part of the life when you're an islander. Yeah. What do you normally fish for? We normally fish for mackerel when we come out. So we use hand lines instead of our rod and reel. My dad made this for us earlier on in the year. Really? This is great. He's fishing with a line. Is that a, is that a traditional Scottish style of fishing? It's what I've been brought up doing, and it's what a lot of the local, local folk do. Do I hold it like this? You can just hold the, the, the twine. Oh, the actual twine, OK. Do oh, I want to drop it all the way to the bottom? Yeah. That would be perfect. Hey, why is yours dropping straight down? Mine's all the way out there at that island. Mine, mine must be heavier than yeah, yours. Seriously. I think your dad set me up. <laughs> oh, you got something? No. A wave, a rogue <laughs> wave. I just feel honored to be able to be out here fishing with you the way that you were taught to fish. And that, it, you know, it's not just on oh. some, oh, you got something. Oh! Oh! Yeah. You are a local fisherman, aren't you, Dave? Yeah. Can we eat this one? Yeah. I mean, not this very second, but this is edible. Absolutely. But before the sea drift runs us aground on the very rocks that shipwreck the SS politician, we're off to snag some riches from the seafloor, and it's not single malt whiskey. You're going to lift that in by hand. All right, so uh, I just scoop You're it up. You're probably better up. taking your gloves off. I'll take the gloves off. If I end up going in, I want you guys to enjoy this meal. Think of me. Oh, yeah, it's heavy. Whoa. We got a lobster! Hey! Oh, yeah, we, we got, got two! One. We got two! Success! <laughs> He's a good lobster. Look at that, huh? That is a big guy. <laughs> That's right. One fish with two lobsters. We got dinner. Yeah. Connected to Eriske by Causeway, the island of South Uist is home to Chef Ian McCrary, owner of Salar Smokehouse, where we steam up our lobsters. You want to split these right there in the middle. 
The reason that we're breaking up the shell is so that the smoke can penetrate? Yep, that should be. I'm glad I got my apron on. Filet our pollock, clean a few local scallops and brown crab legs. And then we'll start smoking. Placed within Ian's custom smokers, in only five minutes time, our freshly caught catch is a feast fit for a hard day's work. Want some whiskey? Yep. Yeah, we'll have one we want. The SS politician. Salange. So I can't say this whiskey is from there, but I can't say it's not. <sighs> My mouth is watering. Dig good. You can really taste just the freshness. You can taste the smoke. The smoke adds a really mm. distinct, delicious flavor to it. Nice, mm. subtle. It's a very nice aftertaste, right? Yeah, that's mm. nice. The smoking originally was done for preservation, not necessarily for flavor. And yet you still smoke. Obviously the flavor was something people really enjoyed. I think people do enjoy that flavor. You've got to have a, a nice balance of, of smoke to, to whatever you're smoking. With a lobster, you want to taste the lobster, not the smoke. Oh, man. Out of the ocean this morning, on your plate that evening. Yeah. That's the way it should be. What more could a visitor to the island want? The Scottish Isles are known for many things. The sprawling landscapes, the laid-back island life, the spirits, and of course, the spirits. So George, I know you're a whiskey man, but what do you think of gin? I enjoy gin and tonic here and there. Yeah? Yeah. Fancy one tonight? Terrific. Yeah, but there's a catch. Okay, tell me. Because in order to get a wee gin at the end of the day, you have to do some work. That's all right, it's kind of my wheelhouse. Okay, well, that's good. Here on the island of Harris, a new distillery is producing gin that bears the island's name. So, Alan, this is the uh, nosing panel. This is where we assess the samples. So, Hello, we take a seat, Hi, then we can uh, begin. After you. Additionally, on the opposite side of this aisle, you'll discover Scottish sugar kelp, the key ingredient in creating Harris gin. Hey, George, this wrong gear. Let's get you into something much more comfy. Okay. Sense of smell, we don't explore. We don't have artists who work the smell because of the way we perceive it. With flavors, you know, with spirit, they're all smell, that's what they're about. Part of what we try to do in distilling, of course, is create smells, create aromas, create flavors. So you're all here trying to make a language of what the different smells are and checking that they're always the same checking for the, the ingredients. Kind of like a gin game show. <laughs> Down here. Down here. Bailing the boat, it's all part of the process. So what are we sniffing for here? Well, we've got six descriptors. Juniper, citrus, green, floral, spice, and maritime. And the so maritime's the kelp. The maritime is the kelp. Do you use the kelp for like the flavor of the gin? That's it. Yeah. Like seaweed? Like from underwater here? Yeah. How does gin that's flavored with sugar kelp taste? It's sort of herby and flowery, and there's a little salty thing at the end. Sort of like the sea. Yeah, exactly. You close your eyes and you smell it, you will be in a place. There's no doubt about it. I think walking along the seashore. It's really interesting that, that Scotland and the islands being synonymous with the sea has a, a gin that's made with seaweed. But I think it would be good cold, you know, really ice cold. Holy shit! Surely sh people thought about adding seaweed to alcohol drinks before, did they? Because it's never been used before as a botanical. We spent a lot of time trying to get the seaweed right. If you put too much in, it flattens the flavour out. Don't put enough in, obviously. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I got water in my ears. You have water everywhere. How to put Paris in a bottle? We are an island, middle of the Atlantic, surrounded by the purest waters. Let's look in the water for ingredients rather than on land. That's right. where we found the sugar cup. OK, I'm going to get some kelp. The sea, obviously, it's very much a part of your culture. Very much so. There's an old Gaelic saying that says, the sea must be visited often. Some days you get something out of the sea, other days it'll give you nothing. But you've got to keep on going back. Oh, this is glorious. This bottle is absolutely beautiful. And what is this written on the bottom? So that's es quam videri, which is Latin, mm. and it actually means be rather than seem to be. Be yourself. Don't pretend someone you're not. Mission accomplished. And it's only fitting that the gin made from the Scottish seas be enjoyed with good company beside those very waters. To the Western Isles. See, that's so aromatic and delicious. You can taste that little kelpy aftertaste. Oh, yes, I can taste the kelp. <laughs> 
That's the fruit of your labour. <laughs> I'm just having a splash more. Oh, you know. Twist my arm. The smells, the sights, the sounds, the tastes. Mm -hmm. This is living. Where right next? Scottish tweed is famous the world round, and if you've ever adorned its finest quality, it's most certainly come from the island of Harris and Lewis. This island is Lewis and Harris, am I correct? Yeah, they're actually all one island. There's a mountain range that kind of separates them, but everybody, including myself, thinks of them as two different islands, especially the islanders. They're very insistent that they're different. And then Harris is where the Harris tweed comes from, right? Correct, George, you're all over it, yeah. But the wool comes from both Lewis and Harris. Today, Harris Tweed is a multi-million dollar machine, but it all stems from humble beginnings and dedicated care of land and livestock. A croft is a strip of ground that has been allotted to our forefathers who came back from the war to go and work so that they could make a living. So it's, and It's like a farm, but in sort of strips. So each one of these is a different croft? Yeah, yeah. Do yeah, you have to have sheep on a croft for it to be a croft, or can you just yeah, have you the land? Can, you, you, can, you can do whatever you like with it, as long as you're doing something with it. Sheep just have to be my yeah. thing. This is something that's been going on for Generate, hundreds, of, hundreds, hundreds of years. Hundreds, yeah. hundreds, of years. hundreds of years. The history of crofting is a very proud thing, because it's all about taking what's rightfully right ours yeah. and making it work. It's important that for the future, that crofts don't lie barren. It's up to us to kind of carry that tradition on. And it's crofters like Ali Williamson that are bridging the times. Let's shear some sheep. A big pair of scissors. Wow. And a Grimm's fairy tale. Yeah. This is how sheep would have been sheared traditionally in the islands and throughout, throughout the world. The electric within the crofting industry is a newer thing. Our breed of sheep, we clip them once a year. Basically, like our hair grows, uh -huh. their hair grows. We'd want to take off all the old stuff. So ideally, where you want to cut right around here yeah. or a little bit? So just, bit. Just, just about half, half, halfway in. Kind of that. Okay. All the way around. You're doing a good job, George. I have some manscaping you could attend to later. Seriously? You mind if I use this? <laughs> <laughs> Settle. Are you all right? Yeah, I think so. Just about there. Something for the weekend, miss? Ah. Uh, you look so cute under there. You bring your look at me. Nailed it. I look at them in the chat. I think it looks good on you. I really do. No, really. A year's worth of labor from both sheep and the crofter alike has already been invested in each fleece by the time it arrives at Shabos Mill, where Margaret Ann McLeod will be our guide on one of their mill tours. So this is the start of the process, where we're using the raw wool. Has that been sort of washed? It's been scoured, so it has been cleaned, and then you've processed the highest quality, and we're going to dye the wool at this stage. I love that colour. So bright and beautiful. It's like uh, cotton candy. Instead of candy, it's wool. How many sheep fleeces are in that? Quite a lot of like sheep fleece in that. It depends who's been shearing them. Once dyed one of 60 colours at the fibre level, the wool can then be mixed with up to nine other shades in blending. And this is how we're going to start actually creating this particular yarn colour. The inspiration for those colours come from the landscape and also the seascape. So you're starting with this, but you're ending with this. So these are the colours of the outer heaven. Look at that, that's beautiful. After we've gone through and we've carded our wool, we then want to spin the wool. So we've got to give the carded wool strength by adding a mechanical twist that will actually let us have a finished yarn we can start weaving with. So this is where we start building our pattern. 1,400 threads across the width. Quite literally creating a tartan right now. He is doing that, yes. Good, but when it's not an official well. clan tartan, we would probably tend to call it a plaid yeah. or a check. Right. For all of you who don't speak Scottish, a <laughs> plaid is a plaid. Charade, charade. <laughs> the threading leaves the mill, and local island weavers like Scott McCurry transform it into textile on custom-made looms. Is the idea to keep an even pace? Yeah, it's like riding a bike in first gear. I'm weaving! Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. And then you can see your work actually in front of you. Right in front yeah. of you. That's satisfying. You can feel my ass lifting as well at the same time. <laughs> Fantastic. And we're off. Isn't it good? Yeah. Oh, oh, the alarm. It's all right. You probably uh -oh. just missed a shot or broke something. Sorry, I got yeah. so excited. <laughs> That's I okay. was super aggressive, wasn't I? Once 50 meters of cloth has been woven, the fabric makes its way back to the mill where every stitch is painstakingly picked over, then washed, and finally given the ultimate stamp of approval. So literally, this is where it gets anointed. 
Indeed it is. The Haddis Tweed Orb stamp is the oldest registered trademark which is in continuous use in the UK. Is that right? Yes. Wow. When we first put it on these spools it wasn't Harris Tweed. Not until it has been inspected and authenticated by the Harris Tweed Authority. I now pronounce you Haddis Tweed. Really is amazing. From this little island in the Outer Hebrides, this tweed will span the world. And this world is inspiring. The Scottish Isles are enchanted and they continually reveal their splendor. Erected before construction ever began on the Great Pyramids of Giza and older than Stonehenge, the calendar standing stones are remarkable and they are humbling. Isn't this amazing? It truly is, it's just awe inspiring. It's incredible. My grandfather was from Scotland and this has just been a trip where I feel very connected to him and I feel very connected to just this land. It's your land. It is. It's in my blood. Somewhere it's coursing through. I, I find it very moving because it's something as a little boy I always imagined what the Outer Hebrides were like and to actually come and really experience them. The land and the seaweed being used and the wool and this. You can still have absolute peace and get away from it all. When you find your place, your part of the world, it never leaves you. In fact, it forever beckons you back. Feeling very fulfilled.